I'd like to thank John for his uh, warm welcome. It's a privilege to be worshipping with the Kettering Church family this Sabbath morning. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, and reading from verse 14 through to verse 21. Ephesians chapter 3, from verse 14 to the end of the chapter. Paul writes, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. I wonder if you have ever prayed a daring and audacious prayer. I'm sure you probably have. The scriptures actually record many a daring and audacious prayer. I wonder which one you'd nominate in the top ten. Perhaps you think of Abraham pleading with God over Sodom and Gomorrah till he's down to ten. Maybe you think of Moses up there in the mountain saying to God, blot me out of the book but don't forget your people. Maybe you think of Gideon with his fleece, his dry and wet fleece. Or maybe you think of Mary, her response to the angel, be it to me as you have promised. Or perhaps the thief on the cross, Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom. But I'd like to suggest that one of the top contenders would have to be Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus that we read in our scripture reading there in Ephesians chapter 3. In this prayer, Paul pours out his heart in longing. And so I'd like you to turn with me to it as we look at it together. We know that this is something that was passionate in the heart of Paul because of the way he begins. He says, and for this reason I kneel. Now, of course, we might not recognize it, but this is a little signal that Paul is in dead and daring earnest about what he is going to pray for. Because as you probably know, the Jews usually stood, stood to pray. And only when they were in great distress and anxiety, as was Jesus when praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, did they get on their knees and prostrate themselves. So here Paul is so filled with a daring desire for his friends in Ephesus that he prostrates himself before God in prayer. For this reason, he says, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray. And then he proceeds to highlight three petitions, three main petitions. The first is there in verse 16. He prays that we may be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
These two clauses, of course, belong together. They're really saying the same thing, aren't they? Because it's through the Spirit that Christ dwells in our hearts. The risen Christ himself is seated and reigning at the right hand of God the Father. But God dwells in our hearts through the ministry of his Spirit. And it's Christ through the indwelling Spirit who can give us the strength for which Paul is praying. And then he moves on to his second petition in the last part of verse 17. That you, being rooted and established in love, may have power with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love which surpasses knowledge. What tremendous language. Once again, there are true phrases that are linked together. The love of which he speaks, of its various dimensions, is the love of Christ. And then he comes to his third petition at the end of verse 19. That we should be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. My, what a daring audacious prayer that we should be filled right up to the brim with the fullness of God that we should be filled with all the fullness of God to the fullest extent to which human beings are capable of receiving I'd like to suggest that that must be one of the most amazing and daring prayers in scripture but I'd like to ask you what you th might think is the relationship between those three petitions. Are they just three separate prayers for different things? Are they simply three parallel statements that he prays for? I don't think they are. I think there's a consecutive link. I think he's praying like this. I wonder if you'll agree with me. He's praying that we may be so inwardly strengthened by the Spirit that as a result, we may be able to comprehend the full dimensions of Christ's love and thereby be filled with all the fullness of God. Now if that's right, if there's a consecutive building up in this prayer, it seems to me that the core focus is on the... Is for Paul is that we should grow to know the love of Christ in all its dimensions. And so for the rest of our time this morning, I'd like us to reflect on those dimensions of the love of Christ. Now, of course, much Paul may have been just using it in a hyperbole, but I find it helpful to think of the different dimensions in different ways. First, let's reflect on the length of the love of Christ. It seems to me that the length of the love of Christ relates to history. Because history, the whole long story of the human family, is a record of the long-suffering love of God. The infinite patience of God with the human family for thousands and thousands of years especially as we see it exhibited towards his covenant people, those whom he entered into a covenant with, in, with at Abraham, the time of Abraham. As you know, in the 2,000 years of Old Testament history, from Abraham to the coming of Christ, Israel kept rebelling against that love. And what was God's response? God kept loving them with his great covenant love in the words of Jeremiah 31 and verse 3 God says I have loved you with an everlasting love and the Israelites were invited to respond in temple worship in the words of Psalm 136 the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever what a wonderful truth and what's true of the Old Testament is of course true of the New 
Testament era. For 2,000 years since Christ, although there have been many glorious episodes and epochs in the history of the Christian church, one would have to confess that there has also been much unfaithfulness, much apathy, much disobedience within the church. And yet God has never abandoned his church. You know, we sometimes hear people speak about the perseverance of the saints. But really, when we talk about the perseverance of the saints, we're talking about the perseverance of God with the saints. I wonder if you remember or recall the marvelous verse in Psalm 138, verse 8, where the psalmist says, The Lord will will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Of course, we often do that, don't we? We start something, but we don't finish it. I wonder how many of us have started a book and failed to read it through to the end. Or maybe we began to play a a musical instrument, perhaps it was the piano or the violin, but we never went on to finish it. There are many things that we begin as humans, but we never finish. But the psalmist says of God, you will never drop the work that you have begun. And you know, the New Testament equivalent to Psalm 138 is surely Philippians 1 and verse 6, where the Apostle Paul says to the young church, in Philippi, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Yes, what confidence the length of the love of Christ gives us as we journey through life. He goes on loving. He never abandons us. He doesn't drop the work that he's begun. This morning I'm so thankful for the infinite patience with wayward sinners like me and perhaps like you also. So let's turn from the length of the love of Christ to reflect on its breadth. And if the length, as it were, speaks to us of history, I'd like to suggest that the breadth speaks to me of geography. His love is so broad that it embraces the whole world and everybody in it. And especially those who are despised and rejected. It includes Jews and Gentiles. It includes ethnic minorities, the poor, the hungry, the underprivileged. It includes women and children, even those who are still unborn and who in Roman times were consigned to the local rubbish dump. We may not love them, but God does. It includes the uncultured and the illiterate, the misfits and the outcasts, those that sometimes we are pleased to consider untouchables. God's love is broad enough to include them all. God's love has no favorites. There's no bias no respect of person or status in the love of Christ. In fact, there's no segment of human society that is beyond his love, the breadth of the love of Christ. And we see it reflected in the composition of the Christian church worldwide, don't we? The Christian church includes members of both sexes, all ages, all races, all classes and types. It's perhaps why Paul says in his prayer, he prays that we may comprehend with all the saints the length and depth and breadth of the love of Christ. Because I wonder whether it's ever possible for us to come to perceive, let alone experience the love of Christ on our own. Our own perception and experience is too narrow to comprehend all the dimension of Christ's love. We need all the people of God to comprehend it from our different cultures and backgrounds, 
That brings us to the third dimension, the depth of Christ's love. The length points in the direction of history, the breadth in the direction of geography. I think the depth points in the direction of psychology. For Christ's love reaches down into the hidden depths of the human personality, even into the depths of our own depravity. There are, of course, different kinds of psychoanalysis, which are called depth psychology, because they try to explore and sometimes expose our hidden repressions and other secrets that we hide even from ourselves. These places of the human personality, the scripture calls the heart, the rational and the emotional parts of our personality are summed up in that term. And according to Jeremiah 17 verse 9, you know the well-known text that the human heart is deceitful and desperately sick. While according to Jesus in Matthew 15 and verse 19, it's out of the heart of men and women that evil things proceed. It's like a deep, deep, well. Normally all the mud and the ooze and the filth are at the bottom of the well and mercifully out of sight and reach. But when the waters of the well are stirred by violent emotion, then the most evil smelling filth breaks to the surface. Hatred, greed, revenge, lust. And we are amazed to discover what lies deep down in our own personality when it wells up and breaks to the surface. But God knows the depths that we sometimes try to hide from ourselves. He knows because he's the heart knower. And he knows the, the depths of our heart, but he loves us despite it all. So the depth of the love of Christ reaches down deep into the depth of our personality and our depravity in order that he might redeem us from these depraved depths. Of course, superficial remedies won't do. There's only one thing that will do, and that's the radical gospel of the new heart. It is possible to receive a new heart, to be born again by the Spirit, and to start life all over again. What a wonderful dimension, the depth of Christ's love, which really can reach those parts that the others can't reach. And so we move from the length, the breadth and depth to the height of the love of Christ. The length speaks to us of history, the breadth of geography, the depth of psychology. And it seems to me that the height of God's love in Christ suggests the direction of the last things, eschatology. That is the end of human history. Let me put it this way. If Christ's love reaches down into the hidden depths of my personality, it also promises to lift me up, up to eventually seat me where he is, at God's right hand. And it will do that literally one day. Of course the process begins here and now. We mustn't limit what God through his spirit is able to do in the present. We are already beginning to subdue our passions, to transform us into the image of Christ. But one day, when Christ comes back, our fallen twisted, tarnished, distorted human nature is going to be eradicated. And we're going to be given a new body and a new environment in the new heaven and new earth when we will be lifted out of the depth and up to the height of Christ himself. Isn't that wonderful? Let's recapitulate these four dimensions. The love of Christ is long because it perseveres with us. 
in its infinite patience. The love of Christ is broad because it involves everybody in its broad embrace. The love of Christ is deep because there is no depth to which it will not reach down to where we are. And the love of Christ is high because one day it will lift us to be where he is. You know, in our uncertain and troubled world, there is nothing that can give us greater assurance than this love of Christ. There are many things in this world that we don't know. There are many things about the future that we don't know. But Paul prays that we may know through the indwelling spirit we can be strengthened to come to know the various dimensions of Christ's love. But perhaps for someone here this morning, their problem is despair. You have failed and fallen so many times in the past that you think there is no hope. There's only despair. Well, let me remind you of the length of the love of Christ. He goes on loving on and on with infinite patience and perseverance so don't give up my friend there is hope or maybe for others the problem is inferiority you have a low self image for, whole, for a whole variety of reasons you may feel that nature has dealt you a bad hand But I want to remind you of the breadth of the love of Christ. It includes you. You may find it difficult to love yourself. You may even despise yourself from time to time. But he loves you with a love that took him all the way to the cross. Oh, the breadth of the love of Christ. Embracing people even like me and you. Or perhaps for some, the problem is one of shame. Maybe we've done and said or thought something which is despicable, for which we despise ourselves, and for which in our better moments we are deeply ashamed. Then I want to remind you of the depth of Christ's love, which came right down into our world, our sinful world, even bearing our sins in his own body and dying our death, identifying himself with us down in the depths. He can raise us up from them. Or maybe finally for some the problem is skepticism. Someone here questions whether they can ever change. You not only think you be, can't be forgiven, you don't think you can ever change. Then permit me to remind you of the height of the love of Christ. From the depths, he can lift you to the heights. He can lift you through the power of the Spirit today and tomorrow and the day after until on that last day when Christ comes, we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, when this corruptible will put on incorruption and this mortal will be clothed with immortality. Please, I beg you, don't underestimate the length, the breadth, the depth or the height of the love of Christ. No, we don't know what the future holds for Brexit, for Trump, to Saudi Arabia, lots of other questions. But Paul says we can know the love of Christ. We can know that it is long enough, broad enough, deep enough, and high enough for all our needs. And my prayer is that Paul's prayer for the Christians at Ephesus may be fulfilled in each of your lives this morning for his namesake.